Hi, good morning. This is JB Morin. I'm going to uh, present you today on a, on a lab seminar for the LIBM. Uh, presentation about social networks and uh, academics and uh, I want to share some some good practice advice and and my experience so to be very clear uh, this is not going to be uh, what's right or what's wrong it's going to be my way and my own experience about using social networks I think overall it's positive and I'm going to try to uh, explain you why so why should academics use social media basically if you want to read a, a great book uh, about asking that question why i advised you that um, you read simon sinek's um, bestseller why should you do that and um, what's the main reason to me the main reason is to get some information in so it means um, know more about your activity and about science and the other reason is to get some information out which is have people know more about your activity. So you can communicate about new research, of course, new works, new jobs, new academic resources. So you can share some interesting resources and you can also benefit from other people uh, sharing resources. You can communicate about you and your team. So it's a way to um, talk about the activity of your lab and everything will lead to more visibility and more impact. This is what I'm going to try to uh, show you. So uh, if, if, if you have some savoir-faire, it means you have some skills, some knowledge. You want to have also some faire savoir, which is a way to tell people about what you are doing. Finally, Social media are a very good way for students, young people, for example, to connect with the community, the scientific community. And it's a good way for the scientific community to connect with you. So the, the only question you need to ask yourself is, do you want people to know more about you and your work? So if you answer to that question, no, then of course, there's no need to use social media. But if you, use, if you answer this, that question with a yes, then it might be useful. So what do I mean by people? Uh, people following you on social media will be mostly colleagues, scientists. They can be also students, but they can be also editors, reviewers, who will be one day uh, assessing your work. Uh, politics, investors, um, deciders, employers, because one day maybe you will try to um, uh, candidate, apply on something. But they can also be practitioners, users or clients. Okay, So we go from the very, very close scientific community to a much larger uh, outreach and a much larger audience. What do I mean by you? It's not exactly you, it's your digital you. It means on social media, it's okay to keep private what you want to keep private because you decide what is published and you decide what part of you and what part of your job you communicate on. So it's definitely not you, it's your digital you. And what do I mean by your work? Well. You can communicate about research, of course. You can communicate about your teaching activity. You can communicate about your uh, productions and conferences, but you can also um, tell people about what you think is good uh, to communicate on sports, uh, passion, etc., etc. So finally, for my French collaborator, why am I doing this uh, seminar in French? Well, that's very, very simple. Uh, in English, sorry, that's very simple. Only 5% of people following me understand French, whereas everybody who is following me understands English. So if I want to speak to a large audience, then I will use English because even French people will understand. And if I speak in French, only French people will understand. So to me, this is clear. If you want to be efficient on social media, you have to use the, let's say, uh, communication language that we use now, which is uh, English.
So now let's go through the uh, six main social media that academics can use. I'm going to list here, so this is the what question. I'm going to list here <clears throat> very briefly the pros and the cons in my opinion and in my experience. So I use all the social media that you see here and this is what I think about. So the first, the two main ones are Twitter and ResearchGate. Uh, why Twitter? Because I think it's um, very, very easy and powerful. So it's very quick and very easy to put some material out. Um, the audience is very large because it's an open social media. You don't need to register. You don't need to, uh, you can connect to anybody. Okay. And um, it's pretty open. Everybody can uh, jump in and follow. The disadvantage, in my opinion, is that it's open. So it's both a very good thing and a bad thing. And because it's open, uh, anybody can comment on anything. And you can also comment and, 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 and be negative, even if you have no background on the topic. So you can often have some uh, trolling comments and, and behaviors on Twitter, uh, which I don't like, but I think that the benefit is, is, is uh, higher than this. ResearchGate is for academics. It's a very, very uh, specific network, but it's a very efficient network. And you deal with targeted content. It means on ResearchGate, you have only access to papers, conferences, um, uh, tables, results, but it's very efficient to communicate within the scientific community. So this is also a disadvantage because it's not fully open and the audience is limited to uh, scientists or students or academics. It's, it's not very easy to have access to a large audience on ResearchGate. Facebook is good, but Facebook is more for private things and for limited audience. So I observe that my Facebook uh, connections are mainly French, mainly local uh, students and groups. And the disadvantage, in my opinion, about Facebook is that the audience is limited. You cannot have as many followers as you want. Um, you have to accept followers, so it's not fully open. Uh, the visibility, in my opinion, is lower than Twitter and there's a lot of pollution because there's a lot of unwanted publications, there's a lot of uh, advertisements, so it's not that easy to communicate with Facebook, in my opinion. Instagram is very cool for visual content and to get some visual content in, so I mostly use Instagram to get some information about people publishing some stuff, uh, such as training, coaches, rehabilitation uh, professionals. It's very quick and easy to get a lot of content um, uh, through Instagram. I don't use it much to communicate because the format is very restrictive. You can only uh, publish some um, photos and pictures and videos. There's, you cannot publish links to papers, etc. unless you have more than 10,000 followers. And there's a lot of pollution uh, as well on Instagram. LinkedIn, of course, is the number one professional uh, network, so I use it for professional um, um, uh, topics. The audience is very interesting because definitely everybody is on LinkedIn for professional reasons, so that's interesting. And it is not fully open, which is to me the main um, disadvantage. So, for example, when, when we publish a paper, I tend to communicate about the paper on all social medias and especially on LinkedIn. Finally, YouTube. Well, it's uh, very interesting because it's very uh, visible platform. Anything you put on YouTube, any video you put uh, will be um, uh, visible, public. It's a good way also to store some content and some videos and to go back to your previous files. And it's a very easy platform to share content because from YouTube, you can push some links and you can um, uh, link to video easily in a tweet or, or on Facebook. For now, let's go to the strategy and you have to think about uh, this. The priority of academics is PubMed. It means the first thing you need to do before sharing information is to publish scientific content and publish information. So I would say that the priority for us academics is PubMed, but PubMed is where the publication process ends. It's also where the publication um, process 
starts with dissemination. Okay, so <clears throat> PubMed is the priority. And I don't know if you remember this joke, but um, yes, this was a suggestion for academic promotions. Tweets are equal to publications. Unfortunately, this is not true. So be very careful. Your uh, playing ground is not Twitter. Your playing ground is PubMed. And of course, official publications. So now a few advice uh, to get some information in. So this is how I use social media and especially Twitter to uh, know more about um, my environment. So you can follow journals. Uh, as you can see here, every indexed journal has a Twitter account or almost every journal. That's important. And so they publish uh, some uh, information. And for example, the Journal of Sports Science publishes uh, some tweets when papers are accepted. So if you follow that Twitter account, you will see every time a paper is accepted, the title of the paper and the main author. So it means you can get information at the source as soon as the paper is accepted officially. So that's very useful. You can also follow some laboratories and societies, scientific societies. So here you have the LIBM Twitter account or the uh, MIP lab in Nantes. And if you follow that account, you will know what's going on at the lab. You will see some experiments going on. So you can see and connect with people and follow what they do. Societies, every major scientific society has a Twitter account. So this is the Twitter account of the um, ACSM. And also you can see information on uh, congresses, uh, publications, etc, etc. So as soon as something is new, you will know it very quickly. And finally, you can follow individuals. So in France, <clears throat> we have the famous Yann Lemaire, who is publishing some infographics about science. But I advise also that you follow um, a researcher named Dan Quintana, because over the last years, he's been very active on using social media to uh, uh, disseminate science and it's giving a lot of very useful advice. <clears throat> For example, here you see this tweet. Uh, you have four ways to get your research known, but only one is uh, going to be an option. So you can read the four solutions you have. You can al already be famous. You can have a famous mentor. You can repeatedly win the peer review lottery or you can actively contribute to social media. And of course, you know what's the best solution and what's the best advice. So if you want to know more, Dan has published a book. The name is t4scientists.com. It's an online book. You can read that in one or two hours. And believe me, it's full of very good technical advice uh, to, to, uh, to manage your Twitter account, what to do, what to avoid. Very interesting. And uh, I'm going to... Uh, what is, what is Dan saying is that a few years ago, the only way you had to uh, have others learn about your research was to publish in a journal or to go to a conference. And this was very limited. Not everybody could do it. And now with social media, people can read your work uh, if they don't know it exists. And this, with social media, you can publish your work, you can share it, even if you are nobody and even if you don't have access to peer review journals uh, easily or to international conferences easily so not all academics use twitter but getting your work in front of those academics that use twitter will increase the chances of getting your work known and this is the only objective push your work so how to do that uh, technically all you need to do is create a Twitter account, um, identify yourself on the network and connect to many accounts that you think are interesting for you. So you can follow the journals that you usually follow. You can follow the people from your lab, the people who publish the research you like. And my advice is that at first you should go all in. You should follow as many people as possible. Okay. And then after a few weeks, after a few months, you want to regulate because if you follow too many people, then you will get too, many, too much information and you will be overwhelmed and you will uh, lose time trying to follow everything. So 
focus on a few accounts, but focus on good accounts. So my rule is 220 and 2. 200 is, I think, the maximum number of accounts you should follow if you want to miss no information. So that's typically what I try to do. Because if you follow too many accounts, then you will very likely miss some information because, um, for example, if all these accounts publish in total 200 tweets per hour, there's no way you can read 200 tweets per hour. So my advice is to regulate the number of accounts. And if a very good information is published somewhere and you don't follow that person, it's very likely that you will see this information through another person you follow that will retweet, etc, etc. 20 is the time and my advice is to try and spend less than 20 minutes per day on Twitter. <clears throat> this is what I try to do and my advice is that you should um, not open Twitter and not receive notifications during the day, but you should have one or two sessions per day only on Twitter. This is the best way to avoid pollution and to avoid constant notifications, all right? So typically in the morning, 10 minutes only on Twitter, and in the afternoon, 10 minutes only on Twitter. The rest of the day, Twitter is closed and uh, I don't see notifications. This is to me the best way not to be uh, polluted. Finally, two, it means two times per year, uh, typically for me it's January and July, you go to your list of accounts and you remove 10% of them. So it means you unfollow 10% of them to make some space for new accounts that will be more interesting. So for example, me, I use that, that rule Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It means if I see something that's really not interesting in someone published by someone I follow, at the first time I say, okay, I give you a second chance. But the second time, if I see something not interesting for my reasons, so this is very subjective, okay? So if I say to myself, well, this was not very interesting, uh, I took time to read that tweet and it's, it's not useful. Then I say, red card, bye-bye, and I unfollow. It doesn't mean I don't like the person. It doesn't mean I don't respect their work. It just means my use of social media, how I see it, doesn't allow me to follow you. So I give you the example of Dan Quintana. I totally like and enjoy what he is publishing and I think is a great contribution to uh, academics but at some point he was publishing too much content on Twitter and I told myself well it takes me too much time to follow Dan so I will unfollow him but from time to time I connect to his, to his uh, Twitter account just to see the last news and, and if there's something interesting you see what I mean so it means you have to regulate your use of social media. So now let's go and see how to do the opposite, how to generate some information and how to get some information out. Rule number one, the content is the priority and then you can consider communicating about the content. Okay, so this is important. You only communicate something that you have produced or something that you find interesting. So the objective for you should be to share interesting stuff. Be careful, share interesting stuff means you will share stuff from other people that you find interesting. And sometimes when you have some interesting stuff coming from you, then you will share it as well. It's very important because if you are only sharing things about you, yourself, what you do, what you think, people will not follow you a lot because um, uh, that's restrictive information. So you want to share some resource, uh, uh, in interesting stuff, and sometimes things from your, for, from your work. Objective number two, you have to focus on this. You have to be strategic as to what are you going to publish, how, where, and when. For example, if you have 
three very important things to share. Don't share them at the same moment. Don't share them uh, in the same uh, tweets. Don't share them on the same day. You have to regulate also what you publish. So I take this quote from Dan Quintana's book. The objective is to educate and entertain. So you help others save time or pass time. A good Twitter account is a Twitter account where you know you will get some very useful information to save time and you will get some cool entertainment to pass time. Objective number three, you want to have a good signal to noise ratio. What is signal to noise on Twitter, Very on social media in general? It's the difference between what is useful, new, important, this is signal, and what is not useful, um, not important, and not new, this is noise. And you want to have a positive signal to noise ratio. So let's talk about strategy. Um, you have to plan and you have to uh, think about your communication on social media before uh, using it. So a few, a few points of improvement I see here from my experience. Example here, this is a tweet that we have published two weeks ago to announce a new paper. So let's see what I put there um, to be efficient. Of course, we use the KISS principle. So it's not keep it simple, stupid, it's keep it short and significant. So Twitter is not the place to, uh, to do some you know, uh, uh, um, literacy and, 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 and nice writing. It's the place to be short and efficient. So here, I use the straight to the point introduction, flashlights, new paper. So it means the first word of my tweet say, I'm going to talk about a new paper. So if people are interesting, uh, interested, they will read the tweet. If they're not interested, they will pass. Second thing is I tag the journals or I tag the other authors that are on Twitter. <clears throat> the idea here is that when you tag someone, um, uh, they will see it and it means they maybe will retweet the information, they will mention your tweet and it's a way to reach more people. The take home message, so you have to be very short and simple. So the paper is asking a question and the main result is validating that question. So yes, pilot study in working, people know in four words what the paper is about. And this is very important because if they don't know exactly what the paper is about, maybe they will not be interested in, in reading it to know more. If they know exactly what's in the paper, well, first, they have the information, and second, they may want to read the paper. Of course, you put a link to access the content. This is, to me, this is the most important thing. If you talk about something but you don't give the link for people to access, uh, it's frustrating and it's useless. So for example, I don't like the tweets that say, uh, this paper has been accepted. No, we want to access your paper. We, we almost don't care it's been accepted. This is good for you, but this is not good for us. We want you to say, this paper has been accepted and you can read it on that link. All right, so this is the link to access. So you can give the official link to the paywall uh, journal, but you can also give a link to a post print to a free access version of your paper, for example, on ResearchGate. So to me, there's a good combination between Twitter and ResearchGate where you can give access to the content. And of course, we um, insert a media uh, in the tweet that can be a figure of the paper, that can be the title, uh, the block title of the paper, or that can be a picture from the experiment, something that will show people what is it about. So it's very important, if a tweet doesn't have a media, it's very likely less written, uh, less read, uh, and, and less impactful. So put some media uh, in your tweets. And finally, the timing, when did I tweet about that? So you have to keep in mind that um, some times in the week are with lower visibility than others. So typically the Sunday end of the day and Wednesday end of the day are interesting times to tweet. You don't want to tell people about your new 
study on a Monday morning because on a Monday morning we all have different tasks and different things to do than, than, than being on social media. So think about the timing. The rule that's very important is the first words. First words engage. It's like uh, anything. When you, when you scan something very quickly and you want information, you read the first words and the first words tell you if you want to read more or not. So don't be unclear. Be very, very short and significant from the beginning of the tweet. And I would say that a good tweet has at minimum one link to some material to some content, one or two emojis just to, you know, uh, look more uh, fancy, one media and one joke. This is very subjective, but it could be good to entertain uh, at the same time you inform people. Finally, this one here, you see the one here announces a thread. So a thread is a series of tweets that you can add to the first one to give more information because you all know that the content of a tweet is limited. <clears throat> so always remember that people will mostly look at the first one, uh, much less at the other ones, but it could be good to announce a paper with a thread. So for example, in this paper, the second tweet brought some data and visuals. I made a graph here that was not in the paper from the raw data to show another point I wanted to show. I put here the link to an older tweet. So it means on the topic, we already had discussed that in a tweet. So I put that tweet here in case people uh, did not see it. And I even uh, added a third tweet to mention about a key associated reference. So that, that paper was a basis for our study. And so I commented on that paper and I tagged the author uh, just to, you know, connect the author with our, our study. So there's two things I omitted here. The first one was to put the link to that paper. So you see this tweet, there is the block of title in gate and posture. So anybody can, can of course identify the paper, but it could have been very helpful to put the link to the paper so people could click and go and read the study if they want. What was the consequence? After two weeks, so it's very short, but after two weeks after these tweets announcing the paper, the visibility was pretty high because the paper had been seen 400 times on ResearchGate after two weeks, which is not bad. But most importantly, the alt metric, so it's alternative metrics of the impact of a paper, you know the alt metric score. The alt metric score was 85 after only two weeks of existence and it was in the top five percent of the research outputs scored by Altmetric. So it means I don't know if this series of tweets and this uh, pushing that paper on social media had that effect. I, I cannot quantify it because I don't have a control situation but I'm sure it contributed a lot and as we will see after there has been some studies showing it contributed a lot. The only uh, important thing is that uh, tweets are very, very um, ephemeral. So it means the life duration of a tweet is 20, 25 seconds. It means people will likely miss my tweets. Um, so in a few months, I will retweet that content so that people who did not see it the first time will now discover the paper. To get some information out about yourself or about your work, a very good idea is to build your own personal website and a blog. So when colleagues or students ask me, is it important to have a personal website? I always say um, it can only be positive. Okay. So first reason is that you will have the opportunity to have a dynamic CV, a resume that's there on the net so people can, can reach you and know more about you. OK, it's a one stop shop. So it's a way to put all the contents you generate at one in, in a single place. So media, conferences, papers, uh, preprints, whatever, you can have them all on your website. And it's very often that I tell people you want to know more about that. Go and see my website. Everything is there. OK, so it's a it's a very good resource. 
The very interesting thing for us academics is the freedom of blogging. You can, when you write a blog post, you can use the language you wish, you can use the format you want, you can put any type of media, graphs you want, and it's very, very, it's much less restrictive than um, uh, standard journals. So it means if you have a nice paper and you want to comment on the paper, you want to bring more content around the paper, you write a blog post, it will take you two hours, four hours, but you will have a very cool content. So if you want to see some examples, you can go to my website and see my blog uh, to see what I put there and what I write. The good thing about the website is also that you have feedback and metrics and you have a good visibility. It means you can use your name as the address of your website. And this is cool because if people look for you on Google, they will very likely end up on your website. So for example, if you, if you search my name on Google, it's very likely that my website, jbmorin.net, will appear first. And also, on my website, I have a contact uh, form where people can contact me even if they don't know my academic email, even if you click there, you write an email and I receive the email directly. So this is very interesting. So it takes about four euros per month in the format I use. I use WordPress. I really like uh, WordPress because there's a lot of templates. I don't know how to code and I don't code to uh, design my website. I use the templates by WordPress and this is very powerful. And I spend between four and eight hours per month to update information and to, let's say, maintain my website uh, there. So of course, it's a lot of time at the beginning, but then it's much less time to uh, run everything. So let's talk about time because this is the main cost of being active on social media. It takes time. But my opinion is that first, you can regulate the time it takes and it takes time for a good reason, okay? So step number one is that it will help you to reach people. Please remember that almost nobody is on PubMed. So it means PubMed is very famous for scientists. It's the number one place to find some research, but the larger audience people, deciders, they almost never go on PubMed. So if you wait people to discover your work on PubMed uh, instead of pushing your work, uh, that's going to be a big difference. And this has been studied, of course. So there's, I'm going to show you now a series of scientific studies about that. So the first study that, that's here is uh, very interesting because it says scientists should not only talk to scientists and preach the choir, they should also talk to the society and to the outreach, the public, uh, and sing from the rooftops. And I really like this sentence um, that says, after about a thousand followers, the range of followers types becomes more diverse and includes research and educational organization, media, etc., etc. So it means at the beginning, you will have very few followers, but this will likely increase if you publish some interesting things. And at some point, you will not only talk to scientists, you will talk to scientists, outreach, media, public decision makers. So it means you will disseminate your work to more people. So if you see this uh, graph here, it's very interesting because they took some scientists' accounts and they look who was following them. So, of course, the majority, the proportion of followers is mostly other scientists, sometimes public, media, etc., etc. And you see that decision makers are very, very small amount of followers. But what's interesting is that if you plot not the number of people following you, but the outreach, which means the number of people you reach through them, you can see that the number of people reached through the, the various categories here is almost the same. And so a few decision makers will follow you, but these decision makers reach a lot of people. So it's the same for media. A few journalists maybe will follow you, 
but they reach a lot of people. So if you add the number of followers and the mass of people they reach, you see that there's a way your publications, your activities, the activities of the lab can reach a very large um, population and decision makers. What's interesting is that the number of followers increases over time. It's uh, typical on Twitter and there's like a turning point where after a small increase in followers, you will have a very sharp increase here. So they discuss that turning point and um, in the science field that they studied, they observed that the turning point was around 444 uh, followers. So the idea is to get to 500 to 1000 followers and then you know that your dissemination will reach a large audience. Step number two is engage people. So it's not only having them get the information, it's also having them engage to the content you publish. So the, the study was very interesting. Uh, you can go and see the details. It's, it's very well done and it's very cool. They compared some papers that had been published but not tweeted by the journal. So it, they only appeared on PubMed and on the journal website to some papers, equivalent papers on the same topic who had been pushed on Twitter and social media. And their conclusion is that the social media release of a research article in the clinical pain sciences increases the number of people who view or download that article. Look, here, this is the comparison. This is the number of PDF downloads per day. And this is what happens when you do nothing. So when you are passive, you wait for people to discover your work and pull that, that work out. The week before, the week after, almost no change around the control date. Now, around the control date, before and after the social media release date, boom. You see, the number of increase, every single line is a paper. The number of downloads is dramatically different. So it means if it's pushed on social media, it will be more often downloaded. So this is engagement. Uh, all of the authors who were on Twitter did their own tweets. So it means maybe some people saw the four tweets, but we don't care. It's not exactly the same content. So it's additional information. And I would say the more, the merrier, because um, the more people tweet about something, the article will, will be more visible. Consequence number one, we obtained a total of 100 retweets. So it means 100 people shared that content to their network and maybe some people shared that content to their network, etc., etc. A total of 60,000 impressions of our tweets and you see, boom, the increase of views of the paper after publication was very, very steep. So this is step number three, impact. If you want your research to impact the community, um, the scientific community first and then the a larger audience community, you have to use social media. And this study published in 2019 is very interesting. They compared the citations of paper that had been tweeted or paper that had not been tweeted. And so they show that the initial visibility correlates with the subsequent citations and visibility. And I love this sentence here. They say the possibility that scholars can push their research out rather than hope they, pull, they, they hope it is pulled in. So it's exactly the same. Do you want people to passively discover your research or do you want them to actively uh, see and receive the information? So this final study I'm going to explain here has been published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery in 2020. They did a very interesting thing. They selected uh, more than 100 papers. Okay, They randomized uh, the papers to some papers that had been tweeted a lot and some paper that had not been tweeted. And they checked the one-year follow-up number of citations. And you know that in science, impact is often the number of citations. 
And what did they observe? Well, clearly, the, paper that, the papers that had been tweeted a lot received more citations, three times, almost four times more than non-tweeted papers. And the altmetric score was nine versus one, one year after. So it means you get your paper more visible, so it is more known, and eventually it's going to be more cited. Okay, and we all know the consequences of citations for academic careers, for, um, uh, you know, applications, grants, opportunities, etc., etc. That is Sport Archive. You have an official date of, of submission and you have an official DOI number. So it means if someone steals your work to submit it, you have a way to prove it was published at that time. So... I never heard about uh, some sad stories um, and some risks of pre-publishing your work. So feel free to do it. So for the conference of today, I did a small tweet here. And in this tweet, so this is the demo I wanted to share. In this tweet here, I put the first picture of my slides. And I said, social media for scientists, why, what, how? And I tag the lab and I tag the university. And I put the take home message, content first, communication second. What did it cost me to do that? It cost me one screenshot. It took me five minutes. Of course, the content of my presentation took me a few runs and, and a few hours of work, of course, but this is the, the, the part that you don't see in the iceberg. So. Tweeting this took me, uh, it was a very small cost. What is the benefit? Why would I do that? First, interesting targets will know. People will know that I did this conference, I did this seminar. Maybe some people will invite me to do this seminar with their uh, staff. But it also shows that there is some activity at the LIBM and at the University of Saint-Étienne. It means we care about this topic at our lab, which is important. And the benefit is also maybe for the community because maybe some other labs will consider uh, addressing social media and maybe some other colleagues will improve their communication. And I think we all benefit from other people improving their practice. The more chances you have uh, of, of people uh, seeing the information. So. Then some colleagues tell me, well, I see a lot of crap and clowns on Twitter, so I don't want to play that game. Yes, basically, you will see some people commenting on your research and they have never published a single paper. That happens. And, and you have famous stories like this one. One day, this, this, this person published the quick brown fox, blah, blah, blah. This sentence includes all the letters in the alphabet. And there has been 500 comments of people saying there is no W, there is no letter E, you're wrong, blah, blah, blah. So it means every single publication can get some comments. Some young people in the game, for example, are very often commenting on everything just to appear as an expert on the topic. Okay, so uh, be careful with that. And this is something you cannot avoid, but you can regulate. You can block people if you think it's worth it. You can unfollow people and respect the bullshit asymmetry principle. This is great and I think this is important. The amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. It means it's very easy to say something that has no sense and to say something that's wrong. And then it's very difficult to prove that this was uh, nonsense. You see what I mean? So my philosophy is let that be and, and don't respond except if there are some uh, insults or some very negative things. But anytime you try to respond because of the format of Twitter, it's useless. And also try not to argue with the stupid people because they will drag you down to their level and beat you with experience. Academics should not go into argues on Twitter because, again, the format doesn't allow um, detailed arguments and the format forces you to oversimplify the arguments. And of course, there is no nuance. The Twitter is not made for nuance. So if you want to bring nuance, 
uh, do a, a write a blog post be clear in that blog post and push that blog post okay and of course some people are very experienced at twitter and commenting and arguing because they do that all day long uh, i can give you some examples it's very funny so as a conclusion as any other uh, social media twitter is a great servant i think it will be very useful to you and for you but it's a bad master so it should not rule your word and the good thing is that you decide you decide what you publish you decide what you react to you decide who you follow who you unfollow and uh, you can keep control on everything thank you for listening and maybe see you on social media and um, i checked yesterday so one month or two months um, after that publication the alt metric score is already 53 which is very good it's in the top five of the alt metric scores so it's important again i don't know if this was the reason for such a visibility but i am sure it helped a lot At, for example the only disadvantage of of youtube i see is that you cannot share any type of content um, you can only share videos so it's pretty restrictive okay